Welcome back to The Whole Person Revolution, a podcast of Comet Magazine. I'm your host, Ann Snyder, and today we get to hear from a much admired figure in the American arts, Oscar Eustace. Oscar is the longstanding artistic director at the Public Theater in New York City and, among a cascade of other accomplishments, discovered the genius of Lin-Manuel Miranda's Broadway knockout musical, Hamilton and midwifed it into global view. I had the memorable privilege of sitting across from Oscar at a small dinner earlier this year, just days after the Dobbs decision was handed down by the Supreme Court. What began convivially amongst a group of strangers soon became sober as people from more progressive persuasions than I were expressing profound levels of shock and despair. Everything was ending, they lamented. We were hurtling backwards as a society. I sat there, a listener, in quiet consternation. How do I, a devout if imperfect Christian, share an anthropology that might yet ring as beautiful in this circle, providing a reframe, a wider aperture, Was it possible to disarm the running assumptions of the conversation and still maintain credibility as a thinking person who cares not to destroy women, but to sow the grounds for a more humane future? I honestly wasn't sure I had the right rhetorical tools in the moment of heated emotions, so I largely just listened and then offered a few thoughts about personhood, rights, and the implications of believing that every human being has a soul of inestimable worth and value. Somehow, once the table turned to universally felt realities of humanity, of the need to rehumanize our age across a range of fronts, a hush settled over us all and provided some needed soft cover over fractures and lenses that would not be mended by one sharp argument. It was in this almost spiritual hush and in this honesty that Oscar began speaking about theater and the profound humanizing potential of theater. I was mesmerized by his conviction and moved by the subtle way in which he was accurately perceiving the political tensions of our moment and invited him on here today to wrap up our series of The Human. Oscar, welcome. You are a gift to America and an embodiment of humane sight. And because of that, definitely humane leadership. Thank you for joining the whole person revolution. Thank you, Anne. So let's just start right away. You know, I um, have really known more of you than knowing you, but we did have a chance to meet um, this past summer. And immediately I thought, now there is a full human being. You know, I think of you as very widely admired nationally, internationally, and beloved for kind of your just unapologetic love for the theater and your belief in the theater. Um, And I have heard you talk about it not only as sort of an essential art form of democracy, but as one of the most powerful schools that can teach us how to be human. (laughs) Mm, Um, mm. So could you just tell us a bit about this? How did you make your way to the theater vocationally? Did you know that it would be a school teaching people how to be human? My, my love for the theater was born, as, as most young people are, not out of any kind of intellectual impulse, but of just real visceral, unconscious, and immediate attraction. Um, I grew up in Minnesota, um, very, very complicated family. Um, which involved everything from radical politics to uh, alcoholism. And I, as I was entering my teenage years, 
uh, I felt quite alienated in many ways from the world around me. Um, mm. And part of it is my personality is that, um, you know, I'm not very Minnesotan. You know, I, I, I laugh way too loudly and God knows I cry too easily for a boy from Minnesota. You know, it just didn't. And I walked into the theater and I immediately recognized that all of the things that made me feel um, like an outsider, like vulnerable out in the world as well, were valued in the theater. Mm -hmm. The fact that I was loud was great because people could hear me. The fact that I could be both joyous and really sad and express them fully, that's the fundamental tool of an actor. Mm -hmm. So I, I started to see that, oh, wait a minute, here's a world that not just accepts me, but embraces me as I am. You know, I say that as my specific story, but I think there's millions of people who could tell that story about themselves in a different way. Yes. Because the theater, I think, is a profoundly accepting place. It's a profoundly embracing place. It it doesn't, you know, and, and it's why so many of us do theater and fall in love with theater when we're young, and we may stop doing it when we're older. But that feeling of being part of a community and being valued and recognized as part of a community, but also you're part of something bigger than yourself. You're not just being valued and recognized for yourself as an individual. I think that's what first drew me. It was very visceral, personal, yeah. psychological. And it's that feeling has never mm. been away. The theater has felt like a home to me for over 50 years now. It's any theater I go into the world, I feel sort of at home there because I, I feel like I'm a citizen of the theater. When you say theater is this crucial, essential art form of democracy, what do you mean by that? Well, I don't believe it's a coincidence that the theater as an art form, the Western theater and the modern theater as we think of it, and democracy as a political system were born in the same decade in the same city in Athens 2,000 years ago. And whether it's that the theater promoted democracy or the democracy required the theater or what's most likely there was some kind of dialectical interaction between them, the same values lay under both. And and what are those values? It, you can't really believe in a democracy if you don't believe that conflicting points of view are valuable. Mm. If you believe that really the best form of government is just doing what I want and doing what I believe and I can impose my beliefs on everybody, you don't really believe in democracy. You're, you're an autocrat who uses democracy. But if you believe in democracy, you believe that the clash of conflicting opinions produces a greater truth, mm. which is a precisely a definition of what happens in the theater. No character in the theater knows the truth, or if they do, it's a really bad play that never gets produced, because right. the central thing the theater is about is the clash of conflicting points of view that lead to a transcendent or third point of view that is bigger than both of those. And so in that very specific way, it's an exercise in democratic thinking, democratic mm. practice, democratic philosophy. Um, and also in, a, in, in an even simpler way, you can't enjoy the theater without practicing empathy. You have mm. to identify with the characters on stage. Um, and you need to identify with different characters with different points of view on stage. If you only identify with one, you're not really enjoying the play. You've got to practice the art of seeing things through somebody else's eyes. And of course, for those of us who make theater, that's what we have to do when, you know, it's famously said that no actor plays a villain. Because if you're a villain, you have to play it from that person's point of view. And they don't think they're a villain in very rare exceptions of Iago announces he's a villain. But for the most part, people embrace their own point of view. And you have to be able to code switch. You have to be able to imagine how it looks like to somebody else. And again, if you can't do that, you can't have democracy. And you can't have theater. Yeah, my husband is in the final weeks in in uh, finishing his next book, which is about the art of seeing another deeply and allowing yourself to be deeply seen. And he's responding, of course, to this sort of felt sense of crisis of solidarity, mm. crisis of sight, of reality, of a shared reality in the U.S., um, but also seeing it at very micro levels in marriages and families, um, in schools and all sorts of mini polities. 
And some of the most helpful people to sort of give him a sense of how to describe this skill and narrate it have been actors, um, stage actors, not not even film actors, although those as well. But so both reading their memoirs and um, just interviewing them and trying to understand what it is to actually inhabit a character. That's really interesting. Here we are. It's November 9th that we're talking. So day after, uh, you know, vaunted election in the U.S., we are divided. Um, but sometimes what I feel like doesn't get talked about enough is the practicality of the role of sort of a bounded container for a whole world to unfurl. And I have to say, it's hard for me to think about anything. It's hard for me to think about a more holistic place for human emotion, conflict, um, the passage of time necessary in any relational understanding, et cetera, outside of the theater. I, mean, I feel like the theater is the most robust container we have for kind of the moral drama of human life, even if it's not necessarily in quote, our real lives. I think you were describing exactly the function of the theater, which at various moments in history, I think it's been able to play beautifully. Right now in the United States, we're not succeeding that at that as well as we should. And that has to do with the fact that the theater is also part of the culture. And over the last 40 years, there's been this kind of siphoning out or the big sort, as somebody said, which is the theaters have tended to thrive in blue enclaves um, mm -hmm. because that is where their audience is. That's where the philanthropy that supports them is. And we've turned our back on half the country, much more than half geographically, but half of the country in terms of uh, the population. And so because of that, and nobody chose to do that, it's just what sort of happened because we followed the money, we followed our artists, we went to where we were, people were interested in us and would support us. But the result of that is the theater audience now is far more homogenous than it should be. We're not mm. actually circling everybody into the theater. And I completely agree with you. And what other place in our society do people regularly gather in large groups to listen to and respond to and feel about deep issues of our lives with no ideological um, uh, uh, test necessary to come in? You, you know, for a church, you need to believe in the church to go sit in the church. For a labor union, you need to belong to that union to go sit in the union. Sporting events bring together, but they bring people together sort of without content. But right. where, where else can you bring in people who believe different things from different walks of life and put them through the common experience of a story? They may not think the same way, but if you put them through an experience where they feel as a group, it's impossible to deny the other's humanity. And so, you know, a lot of what I'm racking my brain about these days is how do we get the theater to where the theater isn't? How do mm. we not turn our back on the red, but lean into the red? How do we figure out how to diversify our audiences, not just racially, but also economically and geographically? And um, I think those are tough challenges for the theater right now, but they're the challenges that we need to rise to if we're going to play the part we should. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Could you give an example of, I mean, I don't know how far along you are in experimenting with this, but are there any signs that you think this will bloom? Uh, there's many, um, but the one that springs to mind is from the Fortune Society. The Fortune mm -hmm. Society is an organization here in New York which is dedicated to helping recently released prisoners reintegrate into life and providing support for them in a, in a transition to try and make them full participating members of the civic body again. And we've been pairing with them for over 10 years now in the public works program. And the other night, they put on a gala celebrating their participation with the public theater. And 10 um, formerly incarcerated people got up and spoke about their experience. And everybody in the room was weeping, but I was weeping particularly hard because I had known that most of them were senior citizens by this point. They'd spent decades behind bars in most cases. And I had watched over 10 years 
the truth of what they stated that night, which is the theater saved my life. And not in some kind mm. of mystic, you know, ooey gooey romantic way, but rather they came out of prison and they had to start putting lives back together with tremendous obstacles that any released prisoner faces. And I have watched how over a decade their participation in the public works program, their participation in theater has been one of the pillars that has kept mm. them sober, kept them yeah. employed, kept them out of the justice system and kept them alive. And, mm. you know, it, it works if you work it. <laughs> it works. Yes. And, um, you know, I hope there'll be many, many other examples that we can point to. I love that you're doing that. In general, the pipelines of actors, directors, choreographers, dancers, the whole ensemble that you're seeing are people's own upbringings and formation coming out of uh, the non-blue um, subcultures. Surprisingly, Anne, yes. Uh, we have people from all demographics, all economic circumstances, you name it, in the theater. But here's something that almost all of them have in common. Almost all of them, like me, felt like outsiders, felt like strangers or um, weirdos in their context. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if, historically, for example, the theater has always been a place, a magnet for gay people. It's been a mm -hmm. magnet for, for people whose sexuality was not accepted by the community and they would come in the theater where it was accepted. And that it's not by any means that all theater people are gay, but I think many, many theater people had that feeling of not fitting in with their culture. And mm -hmm. so they like me, went to a place where they could feel more accepted. But now it's our job to go back to where we came from. And it's our job to speak to the people who we maybe had to leave behind us and try and communicate with them as well. In a way, plays are machines for turning the audience into a community. Mm, I love that. That the, the event that happens, and it's I think it's really true, and the event yeah. that happens at a successful play is not so much on the stage, it's in the audience. Yes. And you even know the feeling viscerally. The reason you want to be in the audience is because you want to laugh when a thousand people are laughing with you. You want to be moved and cry when the auditorium is dead silent and there's sniffles on. You want that sense of collectively going through yeah. a deep emotion and therefore being part of something larger than yourself. And the theater does that better than anything else I know. Yes, and there's a sacredness to it. I love what you're doing on this sort of trying to maybe on some unpopular levels, even within your own guild, make the theater more heterogeneous. This has been an interesting year for the arts. When we met, our dinner table conversations circled to some of the cancellations that had occurred specifically of like Russian artists right after the invasion of Ukraine. And I was very fascinated to hear you and some of the other people at the table who are also have like very seasoned lives in the arts, not necessarily in theater, but in music and visual arts, um, kind of for all the progressivism at the table, have very nuanced and passionate views about, about this. So I'm, I'm just sort of curious, has this been a newer, more vexing piece to your own vocational stewardship of uh, the public theater, of plays that come your way, of plays you're really proud of? Since George Floyd was murdered, there was a, is a huge demand for a kind of racial reckoning and an increase in racial equity and justice everywhere in the country, but it's really happened very strongly in our field, the theater, very strongly at my theater, whose staff was over 50% BIPOC uh, uh, when George Floyd was murdered and still is, um, and professes, you know, very deep commitment to justice and diversity and racial equity and human equity. And there have been really good parts of that uprising, and there's been really problematic parts. And the good part is it's forced many institutions, including mine, many leaders, including me, to re-examine our assumptions, 
to recognize that we had gotten too complacent about how we were accepting certain power imbalances that actually needed to be challenged, how we were actually retaining a kind of authority that was not only not necessary, it was actually hindering the better operating of the theater. And so, so all of that, that's been fantastic. And um, I feel humbled and schooled by the last two and a half years. But at the same time, there is um, a kind of triumph of a political analysis, which looks at race as the only political determinant um, to the exclusion of all the other factors that I was raised with, which have to do with class, e economics levels. It's those, those, uh, those struggles were the struggles that I was weaned on. And the absence of that economic analysis has led to, I think, many really bad consequences. And one of them, um, if you'll forgive me, is that as we've been furiously embroiled in discussions, uh, I felt like saying, you're absolutely right. It would be even better if the public theater were even more anti-racist. That's correct. Mm -hmm. But don't you think we need to pay more attention to the fascists who are literally mm -hmm. about to take over this country? Don't you think that's where our energy should go? And of course, this is one of the historic weaknesses of the left is that it would always rather cannibalize itself than actually recognize who the real foe is and make common cause with everybody who will fight that foe. And, um, you know, young people are prone to this and this particular climate we have, it's, and it includes what you call cancel culture, is, um, is deleterious. It's not, it's not helpful. This conversation is happening within a broader um, series that the magazine behind this podcast comment is um, putting out on sort of a very big question, like we feeling like every age, of course, has its dehumanizing forces. Ours happens to have some particular ones um, that feel like they're all converging at once, some from technology, some from... Um, I think just coming out of COVID and being socially distanced and disembodied, um, sort of this r renewed, I think very important racial reckoning in particular that's happening, but in a context where there's just zero trust and uh, lack of truth in some quarters and, and we could name all the pathologies swirling. Um, and so part of our hope is just to like pepper the imagination and ask people from a variety of sectors to explore you know, what role can my little corner of the world play in helping to rehumanize our age and make sure every single person feels like they belong, like they have infinite dignity and worth, um, and that their life has a purpose. Um, and I'm, I, you know, you've kind of already talked about this so beautifully vis-a-vis -vis what a play does for every single person involved, including the audience. But I, could you just share concretely one or two of your favorite um, memories or experiences of the theater humanizing like everyone in a room and just paint that scene for me? There's a couple of examples that spring to mind and one of them is relatively external, but it's such such a powerful image for me. Uh, Samantha Power, the former ambassador to the UN, uh, is a friend of mine. And when she was at the UN, she got into the habit of bringing fellow ambassadors to the theater as a way of you know increasing the fluidity of their conversations and the depths of their relationships. And oh, that very wise woman. And it was a wonderful period, but it had one incredible concrete result. In 2016, uh, Samantha took the entire Security Council to see our production of Fun Home, which had moved to Broadway, which won the Tony for Best Musical and was a Tony about a lesbian cartoonist and her gay father who committed suicide. And it, it's an exploration that Alison Bechdel, the cartoonist, was doing of the way she was different and the way she was similar to her father beautiful, powerful, deep musical in which, of course, the two central characters are gay. And what Samantha said is she brought the whole security council, but she didn't tell them the content. And at the time, the majority of the security council members were from countries where homosexuality was illegal. Mm. And they watched it. They enjoyed the show. There was some discussion afterwards, but not a lot. But three days later, the Pulse nightclub shooting happened in Orlando, where a gay nightclub was invaded by a killer who shot dozens of people. It was a horrible massacre. 
And three days later, the Security Council came out for the first and only time in its history with a declaration condemning anti-LGBT uh, violence, violence against LGBT people. And it had never happened before. And Samantha talked me through some of the details of it. And she said that would never have been issued by the Security Council if they hadn't just okay. been to see Fun Home. And she said, particularly the Russian ambassador, who I never thought would agree with it, went for it. And she knows Fun Home was part of it. And that, it's, it's a beautiful sort of macro political example of something that I've seen happen all the time where people, you know, when I did Angels in America for the first time, I, I, I could see people come in who were professed outspoken homophobes. And by the end of the seven hours, they were jumping to their feet and applauding, not because mm. their ideology had changed, but because mm-hmm. they had had the experience of identifying with gay characters for seven hours. And yeah. that experience changes you. That experience is, you, and, and, you know, Angels was at the, it didn't cause the change, but it was at the forefront of this huge sea change in what it meant to be gay in the United States. And that was, I think, its particular contribution. It's just you can't, you can't completely demonize somebody who you've identified with on stage for hours. And, you know, to me, that's gorgeous. And at the other end of the spectrum, um, when we take Shakespeare into the prisons and we have the experience of watching prisoners certain they're not going to understand what we're doing, certain they're not going to like what we're going to do, and we don't change the language. We edit the shows, but it's Shakespeare's language. There's no dumbing down of it. And watching them first realize that they're understanding everything that's going on and then realizing that they're enjoying it, you can feel this sort of swell of pride because in a way they're being handed a ticket to the dominant culture. They say, this is for you too. You've been told it wasn't for you. It is for you. It was a time time we were Mm. in a women's prison and doing measure for measure. And the actress playing Isabel is basically told by the evil substitute Duke that she, her brother's life will be saved if she will sleep with him. And she's a nun and she refuses. And he stalks off stage and she's left alone on stage. And the first line of her soliloquy is, to whom should I complain? And in the women's prison on the west side of Manhattan, a voice came from the audience, the police! <laughs> and Nicole, who played that, looked startled for a second. And then she just turned and looked right at the woman and said, if I did report this, who would believe me? Which is Shakespeare's next line. And the woman said, no one, girl. And, you know, I both had this realization that, of course, Shakespeare's audience would have talked back. Those groundlings in the pit were not shushing each other. They were interact. And the, the, the soliloquy was written to have that kind of interaction. But also just how powerful it is that this 400-year-old English poet who wrote an iambic pentameter and none of us understand all of his words can reach people who've had no education in him at all. That, that, and that the power of reaching people that way. Yes. And to say, oh, I would have just loved to see the faces in that room of those prisoners being basically told without words, like you are a full participant in this. You know, and I have to say, it's it's one of the things that uh, when we talked at a dinner party and then talking again to you now that I recognize is that you have a focus on what my friend Larry Bessonet calls the divine spark in every human soul. Mm. It's very different than I, I, I come at politics, you know, from much more sort of class struggle based, you know, mm-hmm. economic strata group of big collectives. Mm-hmm. But the reason that Lear de Bessonet is a friend and the reason that I'm so attracted to this conversation is I recognize the power in adding a social justice frame to the idea of the individual grace, the individual beauty and necessity of every human being you put those together and that feels like a whole person that feels like a whole society (laughs) 
we met in the context of a dinner and I felt a little intimidated. There were all these like very esteemed, largely artists, which was fun. Uh, I mean, I was a musician in a former life. So at least at that level, I felt I had some kindred standing in how we operate in the world. Um, But all of you are so esteemed in your fields. And yet something technically unrelated to any of our, quote, expertise um, vocationally had just happened majorly, uh, the Supreme Court Dobbs decision. I think I was feeling the chasms of worldview. Not so, I was like feeling deep empathy with some of the stories shared at the table um, who were incensed about the decision and felt like the world was falling apart. At the same time, I also have run in worlds where this decision would be celebrated. And I think in that moment, I was just like, oh my goodness, this abyss between like moral universes. I don't know how to bridge it. <laughs> so that's that's sort of what I was feeling, but also this invitation that it's okay to sit there. I was just sort of speechless at the great sincerity of both sides. Then I remember we kind of went, f- and I'm trying to remember how it happened, but I remember you talked about this new sort of discernment you were having about this next chapter of your career and vocation and sort of serving the nation. Um, and and I there was this fascinating thing where you were talking about here you have represented, stewarded an institution, the public theater, commissioned many award-winning plays, watched this humanization occur time and time again, um, communities forged, all these amazing things. Um, and I and I would imagine you have been like a force for like truth telling, um, truth telling about sins in our national life, about um, uh, sort of the value of those most on the margins, the truth about m- the messiness of human life and the imperfections, and there's very rarely moral purity, all the things that occur in a narrative, a great narrative. But you said something, if I remember, that was about um, you want to turn to really thinking through the what it also means to steward sort of civic health and to reimagine our democratic institutions, including the theater, in such a way that justice is honored alongside peace and human dignity. Um, And I found it fascinating because I was in some ways coming from the reverse. I'm like coming more towards truth telling, feeling like most a lot of my own vocation has been spent writing about, thinking about civic health and peace, hopefully not at the expense of justice. But, and for me, this is very, you know, mostly plays out um, in the, in America's racial history. That's kind of where I've lived. So long runway, just to ask if you could share a little bit a few months later, how you're thinking about those tensions. What, what is the call on someone like you in this moment and in the next 10, 20 years? Um, 20 is too long an event horizon for me to think about, but for the, for the, for the next 10, I'll, I'll accept. Um, you know, I can, I can, I'll speak just about me, and there's several specific things that I'm interested in and I think might be what I should be doing. And the first is thinking of theater in a broader way than I have thought of it throughout my career. Throughout my career, I've worked in the nonprofit professional theater. And it has started to occur to me that for the theater to fulfill its function, I need to define the theater in a much broader way. There are amateur theaters. There are community theaters. There are high school theaters. There are all sorts of places where theater takes place that is not the domain of specialized artists, artists, but rather just people making theater. And if I start defining that that's what it is that we have to try to make flower and increase, it's it's not just our profession, it's our practice. It, that gets me really excited because then suddenly different, different avenues of success open up, different avenues of access to different audiences open up. Um, it it's just feels like this model of a professional institution with mm. paying audiences is not the only container for theater. That there are other containers that we can be in dialogue with and we can help inspire, we can help seed them to be created that, that could be a way of extending the impact of our art form, not yes. our profession. Um, I also find myself in a much more quotidian way and thinking, uh, it is my job to 
get this theater ready for somebody else to run it so that the theater is a stable and a permanent part of the cultural landscape and that the person who replaces me does not have to scrabble for survival or spend their time thinking about how they're going to balance the budget, but are able to artistically lead. And at the same time, it's my job to be preparing those leaders so that I'm not going to pick my successor. But what I've committed to the board is that by the time I step down, I will have essentially offered up to them eight to 12 people who I think know the public backwards and forwards, understand our values, have the leadership skills and the artistic skills necessary to run it. And all of these people will be women or people of color or both. Because the one thing that just seems absolutely clear to me is that my successor should not be a straight white man. Or it shouldn't be a white man, period. And, and those two tasks, making sure that the theater is ready to move into the future and making sure that the leaders are ready to take over the theater, that feels like part of the most important single job I have to do here at the public in the next few years. And it, oddly, I'm really excited about it. It feels really challenging and interesting and fun. And after all, I'm not going to produce a better play than Angels in America. I'm not going to produce a better musical than Hamilton. I don't need individual awards or accolades is not, you know, I'm, I'm too old for that. I'm, I've done what I've done. But now it's, it's trying to make sure that the transition prospers, that that, that feels like a, a huge task for me. And it, it again, is more for me personally than it is for the world. But it's one of the things I'm thinking about. Thank you for sharing that. I um, love that posture of how do we get our practice to spread? And there's a word I use a lot that is just uh, logic, like the underlying logic of a really healthy organization or what happens in the theater. And some of that probably might involve, a, maybe you'll shirk back at this, but involve just like some very discerning naming of almost in a listical form, actually, of like there, there's there's practical steps, there's sequence, there's rituals, and there's an undergirding kind of animating logic that has proven itself over and over in the theater mm -hmm. that, frankly, you know, would probably really help folks on Wall Street and would really help rehab communities and would really help um, – a whole variety, obviously, of education broadly, um, even how we think about friendship and how friendships get forged in the theater. Um, I mean, I just think there's so many things to almost like philosophically name the intrinsic goods and mm. then to see the cross-disciplinary ways in which other sectors could borrow uh, and apply in their own context. How interesting. I Years ago, I wrote a little book on... Um, character formation, but it kind of accidentally wound up becoming a, a work on what makes for really beloved communities and healthy organizations. I visited hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of artist colonies and sports teams and businesses and colleges and all, you know, nurse family partnerships, like such a range of kind of civil society efforts. And I wound up seeing the, this pattern, 16 principles that seem to be at play when people come alive and inhabit their own agency and learn how mm -hmm. to like utilize their own interior freedom, but also feel like they, they are no longer me, myself, and I. Like their very definition is out of the I, thou, with another person and even more powerfully in a whole collective community. And the 16th principle that I named was something I called generativity. And the basic idea is like once you have absorbed the culture of something, or you have been so impacted by performing in a play, or you've maybe worked at the public theater for years and years and years as a staff person, and something about the way of life, the spirit, that je ne sais quoi, these are things that are hard to measure. Um, you eventually leave and you it's, it's where you basically, if people were to say, well, what do people after the public theater, if they've been an employee or They've acted in a play there and they've had this significant long-standing performance experience. And then they go start this. They could start a theater. They may start a restaurant. They could go to a totally different sector. What do what do other people say about them? And the, the key is, do they create like mini public theaters wherever they go? I'm just using yours sure. as an example. Um, but the idea is sort of cultural transmission. And I, I just love that that's your ambition now and your sense of 
call um, that's not so much about like nonprofit brand expansion, but something deeper and actually much more transformative. Our, I mentioned uh, Leah DeBesne before, who with me founded our public works program uh, 11 years ago, and where we go out to communities, form partnerships with community-based organizations, and then make theater with people in those communities that culminates in these huge pageants every year at the Delcourt with hundreds of community members acting alongside Tony Award-winning actors. And it's just mm. magical. But there's a principle that she brought into this that I thought was it has proved to be incredibly effective, which is we didn't come bearing gifts. We went to the community-based organizations and we said, here's who we are. Here's our resources. What can we do for you? What do you want? And one example is the Brownsville Senior Center in Brooklyn. They wanted a jazzercise class. Now, hmm. there's a world in which we could have said, a jazzer, we don't do jazzercise, we don't do exercise class. But we said, okay. And we started doing a jazzercise class there. And let's and we also inviting people to the theater to see the shows, bringing them here for potlucks and doing jazzercise. And wouldn't you know it, within a few months, the women were actually interested. These were all women. These senior women were actually interested in maybe doing some dances from a show. And then mm. they actually have become now our standard, you know, dance course for the musical Shakespeare productions we put on the pageants. And last two years ago, I saw them do an all female version of the piano lesson at the Brown Street. So they they had an an entry point into the theater that in, yes. ended up with them being in the whole thing. But we started from what they wanted. We didn't start from what we wanted them to do. And to me, that I, I just think that principle has worked so spectacularly that we can go to communities. We can go to communities in red counties, red states, not to say, here's this lesson we want to teach you or here's this thing we want you to do, but we're theater. What's your, what are your needs here? What could we buy? And mm -hmm. start actually a real dialogue, not a mm -hmm. fake dialogue in which we know the answer they're supposed to give, but a real dialogue where we can start to create things together. And hopefully those blossom into, not to quote Mao, but a thousand flowers. Um, <laughs> yes. it's, uh, it's just, that's his best one. <laughs> yeah. It, it just feels to me that that's, you know, that, that seeding, that, that helping, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. uh, communities that maybe don't have easy access to culture, uncover the culture within their communities and f help them find a form and expression for another way of thinking about it is imagine the music man where Harold Hill, unbeknownst to himself, is not a fake at all. He's doing exactly the thing that that town needs, which is going to the young people and saying, you are musicians. Believe mm. in yourself. Make some music. The think system, which, of course, is a con on the surface. But underneath, it's not a con at all. It's saying, yeah. I believe in you kids. I believe you can make music. Make some music. And that that belief is more important than the technical training of a Juilliard teacher had shown up in Iowa. So I, it's just, it's something I'm obviously really curious and excited about what we can do with that in the future. There's a brilliant philosopher who I have been reading recently named Alistair McIntyre. Oh, you've gotten into Alistair McIntyre. Welcome to a world. <laughs> See, so you know. Nobody <laughs> in the <my> world. <laughs> nobody in the theater knows what I'm talking about when I start talking about him. But you know, in, in After Virtue, his, his masterpiece, um, he says at the end, he defines what the good life is. He has the temerity mm -hmm. to do that. And he's got three criteria. And to me, they all speak to the theater, is that you have to have a role in society and you have to play it well. And that society mm -hmm. can be as small as your family, but you have to have a role and you have to play it well. You have to be part of a practice that existed yeah. before you were born, will exist after you're gone, and that where you can begin as a novice and get increasing mastery as your life goes on. And the third is you have to have a narrative of your life that makes sense of your life. And 
you know, part of the reason he struck me so hard is, you know, throughout the 500 pages of After Virtue, he's never mentioned the theater, but you get to the end and I'm going, that, that just totally aligns with where yes. value springs from in my life. That to- and, and the theater asks people to do all three of those things. And it's, it just felt like a sort of magical coming together mm. of a philosophical point of view in my profession in a way that was deeply moving. Oh, I love I love hearing that you um, you're describing. Our goal actually is to provide that kind of philosophical language um, and imagination to just articulate what people like you inhabit and do on a daily basis, like what I call sort of the real heroes of our common life. Um, and so to hear you say that about a McIntyre, I know that feeling. It's like a clicking into place. Um, and you happen to inhabit the most holistic, whole life uh, stage um, for those three things that McIntyre laid out. Um, when I referred to you as someone, when I encountered you briefly at this party, and I was like, that's a full human being, kind of what I meant by that was not just sort of someone who is comfortable um, with emotional expression and there's an ease to that, which I think takes just a certain amount of, that's an earned thing often. So there was that, but it was also just like someone, I'm, I'm very drawn to people that, um, seem to have kind of a, a right assessment of value. Like they respond to what, mo- what matters most in life, like viscerally and something, uh, some, that quality sort of emanated from you and what you said that evening when we met. Um, And there's something in that when I talk about, you know, we are all in some ways, even if we're full-grown adults, as we work through wounds in our lives and losses and tragedies, but also reflect on all the things that are to be grateful for and really the move of love in our lives, I think we're all on some lifelong journey to become more and more human, um, ideally, uh, whether or not the forces around us are encouraging of that. And, you know, you, you, you kindly said something about like my, the, the divine spark or something. And, and when I really think about like what it means to be fully human and to respond well to value, um, I do think there's something spiritual in that. There's something transcendent and I, it's a mystery. Um, and, but uh, as you're as you're reflecting on this delicious thing you've gotten to do all these years of oversee a theater and just be in that world, I have to think that not only have there been some just extraordinarily like human moments of deep anguish and gorgeous beauty and speechless awe and all those things, but in some of that, there have been moments of transcendence. Um, I don't know if I'm right about that, but if I'm the least bit right, could you name what you find to be the most transcendent or spiritual part of the theater for you? It is the moments in the rehearsal room when we find things together, the actors, myself, uh, as the director, the, the other folks, and a play just opens up and you Mm. suddenly are seeing the truth that underlay the play all along that you weren't seeing before. That, Mm. that moment is for me as a professionally, and and sometimes it's very analytical. Sometimes I'm doing it as a dramaturg. Oh yes, this and this. Sometimes it happens by an actor revealing it. And then there's a second moment, which is when that kind of, truth, that kind of discovery, the thing that we've made hits an audience and the audience responds back and we realize we've taken them to where we wanted to. We've taken them to the truth that we found ourselves in that room. And that is so exciting because it's mm-hmm. it's not just a validation of the fact that we can communicate it. It's that it really is something there. It's something real. It's something... Um, that moves other people and therefore puts us in commonality with these other people. And, you know, that, that's, you said a little bit about this before is that when that happens, the, 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 the bonds of ego 
just fall mm-hmm. away. And I don't feel like I'm defined by this body and, and dying feels okay because yeah, I'll die, but everything I am is also in this larger world that's going to keep living after I'm gone. It's yeah, bound up in this. Yeah. yeah. Oscar Eustace, quite an honor. Thank you so much. Um, This has been just some beautiful insights and reflections, and I just really appreciate your transparency. So thank you. And further up and further into you as you pursue this very exciting and I think uh, integrating of all things next chapter. Well, thank you, man. As uh, you proved when I first met you at the dinner table, you're an amazing interlocutor. You're wonderful conversation. Oh, you're very kind. It's really true. And this is this this has been so pleasurable for me. So thank you. Ditto, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Whole Person Revolution Podcast, which is as much a cultural compass for comment as it is an incarnate witness of the hope we explore in our pages. Like what you heard? Check out this podcast intellectual seedbed at www.comment.org, where you'll find an artistic rendering of essays that shed light on the very real shadows afflicting the peace of our commons today, but also the many cracks of light. And consider joining us. You can write, you can read, you can host a comment supper in your neighborhood, or you can suggest questions that are pressing upon your desire to be an agent of grace and truth and gentleness and trustworthiness. We want to hear from you and we need to learn from you. Write to us at comment at cardis.ca and expect a sincere exchange. We're honored to have you within our orbit and to pilgrim together toward wholeness in a world splintering against it. The Whole Person Revolution is hosted by Comet Magazine, produced and with original music by Ali Crummy, audience strategy by Matt Crummy. I'm Ann Snyder, and I'll see you next week.